All right. Hello. 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 Hello and welcome to the Cloud English podcast. It's been a little while. I took a week or two break, but I'm back. It's good to have you. We have a lot to talk about today. We're going to be focusing on American English, how we can, well, let's say tease out the differences between American and British English, some of the nuances of specifically American English. We're going to be looking at some specific phrases and pronunciation that are exclusive. Eh, well, yeah, I guess we could say that to American English. We're also going to be going through a bit of history about this word America, which I think is going to be interesting, something I've been wanting to talk about for a while, just because it's interesting. And we're also going to be looking at how you can improve your pronunciation using ChatGPT. What? Improve my pronunciation using ChatGPT? Is it possible? It is, I think. So we're going to be looking at that. We're going to be spending a little time on that. And we're going to be looking at a scene from Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. And we're going to be learning some useful words and phrases from that. That is a thing that we do. And that is one of the things that we are going to be doing. I am on day five of a five day fast. What does that mean? I have not eaten in five days. <laughs> so I think considering I'm doing okay. But if in this podcast episode, I say something that doesn't make any sense, something that's strange or confused, deranged, well, let's just assume that it is a side effect of being on the last day of a five day water fast. I will just consider it a win to get through everything that we have on the docket without any major catastrophes. That would be a huge win in my view. But we do, in all seriousness, have a lot to talk about today. And I think it's going to be interesting. Interesting, informative, insightful, perhaps even, maybe, engaging. Eh, maybe not that far. I wouldn't go that far. Entertaining? Absolutely not. Let's see, what else? My ChatGPT writing course will be coming out soon. That is not a writing course exclusively for English learners. It is for everyone who wants to create really good writing in ChatGPT. <laughs> Have I cracked the code? Well, I think I've come up with, I've been using ChatGPT since it launched, and I think in my humble yet arrogant opinion, I think that the methods that I use to get really good results for a lot of different writing applications are solid and they're solid because they're based on principles and approaches rather than specific prompts so the prompts are flexible the prompts continue to evolve and change over time the approaches are what's really important and thinking of things in terms of approaches frameworks methodologies this is better i think this is a better this is more future proofed uh, and it allows you to develop your own way of doing things right so there's that. If you haven't already done so, I would appreciate if you could hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't already done that so that you can see future videos, two to three videos going out now per week in addition to our weekly show, which is what we're doing right now. <laughs> if you want to catch these live, we try to keep them on Friday, but let us I have to be honest with myself. I'm not keeping my own schedule, and that's a shame. That's a shameful thing. I'm ashamed of not doing that and i want to do better uh if you want to join you can join the free discord that's a community it is free you can click on the link and sign up those listening you can watch on youtube or facebook those watching you can also listen spotify apple podcast all of those two episodes those go up shortly after the live recording of the podcast so if you want to listen Definitely check out the uh, check out. We'll just search Cloud English wherever you listen to podcasts, and you'll find it, or find that in the links in the description. And you can get a free course, Natural English Conversations. That is a free course to teach you how to, well, have natural English conversations. Also in the links in the description. All right. 
So with that business out of the way, I think we can get started with the business at hand. I see we have some people joining live, including Luba. Certainly great to have you here. And Ridwan, I see Lucas, great to have everybody here. Now, if you have any questions as we go along, feel free to pop those in. I will periodically be going through the chat to see if we have any interesting questions. I will be ignoring any uninteresting questions and I'll do my best. I'll do my best. Okay, so first, first, First and foremost, I suppose. Uh, hold on, let me change my fade slightly. I'm seeing a slight. Oh, okay. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me. Do, I have to do one small thing here. Hey, there we go. It's done. Hey, that's better. I don't know if you know what I did, but if you know about video stuff, then you know what I just did. But if you don't know about video stuff, you might not know what I just did. Regardless, I just did it. Okay. Hello, Jacqueline. Hello. So. Because I've been asked this question more than once, it's been kind of rattling around in my head for the last few years. Why is America called America when it's only one country in a whole continent? Or let's say a whole hemisphere, right, with two continents, both of which have the word America in their name, North America, South America. And you could call Central America a piece there too, but for simplicity, North and South America. What's going on here? Why is America America, but it's in the Americas? Hmm, <laughs> that's confusing, right? What is happening with the name of a country? Why is this country called that name, right? Why do, when everyone says Americans, why do people know that we mean people from the United States of America. And I, I'd like to approach it from different angles because I think it's very interesting to explore this more broadly, okay? So I'm not trying to prove anything here. I'm trying to give you a perspective on why countries are called what they're called and why we refer to countries as certain things and not others, right? For example, Canada, the official name of Canada is, do you know? The Dominion of Canada. <laughs> that sounds like evil, but that's what it's called. But we don't say the Dominion of Canada. We say Canada. We don't say the People's Republic of China every time. We say China. So let's get into this. First, let's consider that there are 35 countries, around 35, I believe, countries in various territories in North, South, and Central America, right? Only the United States of America has, this is the thing that might surprise you, only one country has the name, the word rather, America in its name. Did you know that? Only the United States of America has that word in its official name. So, the Dominion of Canada. America is not in that, right? All of the other countries, I don't want to go through the whole list because I don't know all of the official names, but all of the other countries that you could name in North, South, and Central America do not, I should say none of them, none of them have the word America in their name. Interesting. So the continents are called North, South America, Central America. I always feel confused about that. Do we say North and South America and we call Central America that sort of as a carve out? Anyway, I guess that's a different question. I'm always confused about that. Can I just say North and South America? So it makes sense. It's the only one with <laughs> America in the name that kind of qualifies it to be called that, right? Okay, but all of those other countries are also in North or South America, right? Yes. But people usually don't identify with their continent. People usually identify with their country, perhaps with their city, right? If it's a, well, I guess it depends on the unit, I suppose, the size. But generally speaking, nobody is identifying 
generally as a person from X continent, right? You're more likely to hear someone from Africa identify as Egyptian or Ethiopian rather than African in general, in general, right? I don't identify as North American. I identify as American because that includes Canada. And I would never want to put myself uh, in that group. <laughs> okay, so from that standpoint, it's the only one with America in its name. And since people usually identify with their country rather than their continent, it makes perfect sense. But we can attack this or approach it rather from a different angle. Adjectives. Let's think about adjectives. So nationality is often expressed using an adjective. People might say, I'm German, I'm Peruvian. And there aren't hard and fast rules about how those adjectives work, right? For example, Thailandese doesn't work. So we say Thai. Thai is the adjective for Thailand. So if you're from Thailand, when you're speaking English, you would say, I'm Thai. I'm Thai. Okay. German from Germany. Peruvian. So sometimes you have the A-N there. Sometimes you have the E's ending, like Japanese, Chinese, right? But it's not uniform. So what we do is we figure out which sounds good, right? To build an adjective form that is easy for people to say, essentially, right? They're created usually based on the country's name. And again, they have to be fairly easy for people to say. That's why I believe that's why we're not saying Thailandese because it's hard. So we go with Thai. So what words are you going to use in the official name of the country to make the adjective, right? For example, the People's Republic of China. Of these, could we say peoplese or republic republicies or something like that? Kingdom of Thailand. That's the official name of Thailand. Kingdom ease. Well, no. The reason is that you have to choose something that is within the official name unique. You, know, you don't have to. I mean, that's what we usually do when we come up with, when we use an adjective for a country. We choose something that is unique to that place or to that country, and then we turn that into the adjective, right? I think Argentina is the Argentine Republic. I could be wrong there, but because many countries have republic in them, it doesn't really identify it well, and so that would be confusing if you said Republicans. Well, Republicans, what does that mean? <laughs> that I hear that, I think of a political party, right? So, Argentinians, there you go, right? United Mexican States. That is the official name of Mexico, the United Mexican States. I don't think it's the United Mexican States. I think it's just United Mexican States. Well, you have, you have there United and States. <laughs> That's the same as the United States of America. So that would be confusing, right? So when you're attempting to create the adjective, the doesn't make sense, the-ians, <laughs> right? united ease states-ians, us-ians, all of those just sound awkward and weird. The only one that actually works is American. It's the only convenient, unique, easy to say option. It's the only option available. It's the only one that it is unique and not a mouthful and actually makes sense as an adjective. So approach number two, adjectives makes perfect sense. Okay, number three is history. So if you know the history of the colonization of the new world by Europeans, that started in the, well, it started in the late 15th century, but many people started coming in in the 16th century, and this was called the New World. But also, as more and more people started to come to the New World, names began to sort of arise, and when people would refer to specific places, they would come up with these names to call those places. Well, how do you differentiate, for example, the 13 colonies in North America? So there were 13 
British colonies, right? Under King George II, I think that's right. What do you call them? Do you have to say the colonies every time? Well, often, yes, the colonies, but there were other colonies. So Americans in around the, I think it was around the 17th century, people started using that term to refer to people in the 13 British colonies as Americans, right? So not referring to it as a whole country because it was still part of the British Empire, but referring to the people who live there as Americans. And again, for the reasons we discussed, it makes sense. So we have the historical angle, which is interesting. And I would encourage you, if you're interested in this stuff, this is just one angle that is interesting to me. Think about your own country and where the name comes from. I mean, do this for English, but do it in your own language too. It's interesting to sort of go back and look at why are why are the things that I say like this? <laughs> why am I saying the things that I'm saying? I think it's a very interesting exercise, right? Four, you know what I mean, right? Essentially, language is a way to communicate ideas effectively. That's all it is. It's nothing more. So, it sort of got first dibs <laughs> to this name. And everyone knows what people mean when they say it, right? If I say, I'm American, you don't think I'm Canadian. You think I'm from the United States of America. You know what I mean, right? So, at the end of the day, words become common by sort of this organic process of people starting to say something and then other people picking it up. It spreads around like a meme because it is a meme. It enters the language. It grabs hold of the language. And then you know what I mean. Or right? if I say banana, pink elephant, you just had two of those in your head just now. You had a banana and a pink elephant, guaranteed. So when I say America, you know what I'm talking about. You know I'm not talking about the continent of, for example, North or South America. You know I'm talking about the United States of America, right? So America is just like any other country, Germany, China, Thailand, Canada, the Dominion of Canada. And... It's interesting to me to explore the things that we don't think about very often, and I would encourage you to do the same. Why is any word the way it is? Does that help you improve your English? Not necessarily, but for the sake of learning more about history, learning more about how languages work, how adjectives form, I find it to be very fascinating. If you have any questions about this, let me know. If you haven't already done so, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe and also get a free course natural english conversations in the links in the description okay all right um oops i'm a french canadian but i live in virginia hallelujah hello Lene. mexico is part of north america and central america okay so so juan explain this to me how can something be part of north america and central america Aren't, isn't that just two ways of approaching the question? Because some people say the old system, is, well, the system is there are, there are seven continents. So historically, I guess that was North and South America. But then, then we got Central America. So do we call that a continent or is that a region? I, I genuinely am confused about this. I, I genuinely don't know the answer. Okay. That's great to see more people joining. Great to have you all. Awesome. And again, if you have any questions about pronunciation, idioms, culture, grammar, whatever, feel free to ask. I'm on, as I said at the beginning, day five of a five-day fast, meaning I have not eaten a single bite of food, since Sunday, last Sunday evening, it is Friday, May 12th, so five days, and so I'm going to be eating 
in a little bit. You have to eat slowly though when you do a fast. So if, if, if you've never fasted before, it's I, I can't recommend it to everybody, but it is really interesting. It's a really great experience. After the first 24 hours, you don't feel hungry anymore. There's no craving. There's no, ah, I wish I could eat it. Just sort of, you just kind of forget about food. It's weird. And I'm drinking water uh, for my fast. And it's, it's, it's an interesting sensation because in my head, I feel quite clear. And I feel really good. Actually, I feel great. I feel uh, like I don't have any inflammation or anything like that. I feel fantastic. But I'm I'm moving I'm I'm moving slowly, which is a weird thing, right? Why am I moving slowly? I think it's because you're changing fuel sources when you normally eat your you're burning carbs and sugar, and that's your energy source, and that's sort of a higher intense intensity energy, I think. And when you aren't when you don't have that, then your body has to turn fat into energy. And it's fine, but it's sort of a lower burn, I feel. I don't know anything about this, but it feels like a lower burn. So I just, I'm just kind of slow, moving slowly, which is interesting. But the other thing to consider is when you exit the fast, you can't just start eating like crazy. Uh, there's this thing called refeeding syndrome. And if you don't resume eating correctly the longer the fast the higher the risk of this so five days is actually not that long there are people who fast for 10 and 14 30 40 days then there's a really serious risk of this refeeding syndrome so essentially if you were to fast for seven or ten days and then eat a giant thanksgiving dinner or something you'd probably die <laughs> or something like it it's it's a it's a real thing. It, it sort of sh it'll shock your body to the point where organs can shut down. It's 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 very serious. So you have to very gradually begin to eat. Have some very light, a couple of calories here and there, some broth, and then over the next couple of days you can increase your uh, increase the amount that you eat. But um, it's been a very interesting experience, and I definitely want to do it again. I, I think I'm going to do it every year. I think every year I'll do a five-day water fast. That's my plan anyway. That's my plan. Just because uh, for health reasons, right? I did some research, and it seems like it's a good way to... Uh, it seems to be a good trick for longevity, and also... Um, uh, to prevent sort of the diseases that come later in life. You know, I'm 34 now. I'm an old man. So as I move toward, as I move rapidly toward 60, uh, you know, I want to make sure that I'm healthy. I want to be a healthy old man rather than an unhealthy old man. And I think uh, that's one of the factors. Okay. So, next, we are going to take a look at a clip from Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 and hope for the best in terms of, uh, in terms of copyright. I think we should be okay because we're just going to be watching little sections and pulling out clips, so I think we should be good. Okay. So, let's hop over, let's hop over here to Guardians. Give me one second. Has anyone seen Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3? Uh, it's actually, a, I thought it was quite good. I thought it was very good. I really enjoyed it. Would see again for sure. All right. All right. So here, here we go. Listen carefully. We'll pull out words and then we're going to use. Uh, we're going to use ChatGPT to to help us here to um, uh, include some some key language, right? Where is my ChatGPT? Wait one second. Where's my? Hold on. 
Where's my... Where is my chat GPT overlay? Sorry, give me a second here. All right, there's that, there's that. Hmm. Mm-hmm. 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 I think now I've got it figured out. I, I accidentally, I made a mistake. Now we're good. Okay, so here we go. Listen carefully. We're gonna pull out some language from this scene toward the end. A uh, spoiler warning, perhaps there might be a few things here that are spoiled. So if you don't wanna hear anything and you haven't seen the movie, avert your eyes and plug your ears for a few minutes. Your friend wants to come. Okay, one sec. Gotta fix my audio. There we go. Oh, so many tech issues today. Stop with the tech issues, all right? Okay, now we're ready. Let's take a look at this clip, listen carefully, turn on your ears, and see if you can figure out what each word or phrase that we're going to pull out means and see if you can use it yourself make your own sentences your friend once took advantage i learned my lessons i aimed some small part of my mental capacity back in my own direction okay you hear that take advantage listen for that listen for take advantage take advantage I learned my lessons. A friend once took advantage. A friend once took advantage. Your friend once took advantage. Your friend once took advantage. So this is a very interesting phrase to take advantage because it has two main uses. It has a positive one and a negative one to take advantage of an opportunity, to take advantage of someone's maybe assistance, to take advantage of a resource, to take advantage of uh, an, an advantage, to take advantage of something that you have that maybe others don't have. This is usually the positive meaning. I'm gonna take full advantage of the campus library while I'm here for four years. There are so many great resources, scientific research that are, that's hard to access elsewhere. I'm going to take full advantage, but this has a negative side. And the negative side is to abuse something. So someone has used you or you are using someone else. I said you could sleep on my couch for three days. You've been here for two weeks. You're taking advantage of me. You're taking advantage of my generosity, of my kindness, right? So... This is bad because this is something that has been given, something that has been offered, and you're, you're taking not just a little bit, but you're taking as much as you can. So that's the negative meaning. Which one is it here? Probably the negative meaning, okay? I learned your friend once took advantage. Your friend once took advantage. Now he's referring to Rocket Raccoon in this and basically saying um, he, he, he regards Rocket as a sort of a negative of, uh, of using his, I guess, resources and uh, uh, his kindness. I don't actually know what he's talking about because he's insane in the movie. He's pure evil. So let's see what ChatGPT gives us if we say take, uh, take advantage. Uh, and then I want to see if it gives us the positive, the negative, or both, right? That's what I want to see. Definition, to take advantage means to use a particular situation to do or get what you want, often in an unfair way. So it's, it's giving us the negative. And I think it's giving us the negative because that is more common. 
The more common one is the negative one, not the positive one. He took advantage of the confusion to slip away from the party without anyone noticing. It's not right to take advantage of someone's trust. It can seriously damage the relationship. Totally agree. Totally agree. Okay. So, let's keep going. I learned my Your friend once took advantage. I learned my lessons. I aimed some small part of my mental capacity back in my own direction. I aimed some of my mental capacity back in my own direction. I think that, well, let's listen to that one more time. I aimed some small part of my mental capacity back in my own direction. Some small part of my mental capacity. So what is the difference between mental capacity and intelligence? Well, it's often not super clear what that means because often they could be used interchangeably. Your mental capacity is how intelligent you are. But generally speaking, mental capacity could be a broader concept than just intelligence because mental capacity might include reasoning skills. It might include things like adaptability. It might include aspects of your character. It might include uh, your ability to sort of um, plan things in your head. It could include memory, right? We often regard intelligence and memory as two separate things. So then we get into these little buckets where, okay, that is it intelligence or memory or are those the same? Where we can have a broader category of the, the power of your mind. What can your mind do? And that is your mental capacity. Basically, how much are you capable of mentally? That's basically what we're talking about here, okay? So again, let's just reinforce this here. Let's look at mental capacity. Mental capacity. Definition, mental capacity refers to a person's ability to understand, make, and communicate decisions that affect their daily life. It can involve various cognitive functions such as memory, comprehension, reasoning, and decision making. Right. So that bundle, if you're just talking about memory, just talking about reasoning, those could be two separate things happening in the mind. Okay, let's expand that and just say one thing. Mental capacity. My immense mental capacity, or I feel like my mental capacity is declining. After the accident, the doctors had to assess his mental capacity to determine if he was capable of living independently. The, co the court declared that the elderly man lacked the mental capacity to manage his own financial affairs. So a guardian was appointed. Good examples. Thank you so much, ChatGPT. Let's move on. Let's keep going. We have, we're going to be looking at four more here. So listen carefully. My mental capacity back in my own direction. And now gravity itself serves my whims. You must. Gravity itself serves my whims. I want you to listen to the word whims here. Serves my whims. You must now gravity itself serves my whims. You must gravity itself serves my whims. What is a whim? Well, a whim is something that we do off offhand. We don't plan it. It's a casual thing like I decided to fly to California for a weekend trip on a whim, on a whim. So I didn't plan it months ahead of time. It was this sudden impulsive decision and it just came up. It was a feeling I had, you know what? I need to get out of here and go. So that's what I did. So that would be a whim. On a whim, I walked into a store and bought a brand new jacket. Okay, now my whims, often when we say it like this, we're saying, well, whatever whim I have, whatever casual thought comes up, then I'll do that, right? I, I generally act on my whims. Now, he's talking about gravity obeying his whims. So his mental capacity is so great that he's mastered gravity. And if he casually decides to throw someone across the room using his power over gravity, he can certainly do that but it's a sudden decision that he might make, right? And so it's sort of like saying, yeah, whatever I feel like, gravity will obey me. 
itself serves my whims. Oh. Gravity itself serves my whims. So it's gravity that's serving his whims. So if you serve someone's whims is whatever I say, you do. If that's a person, okay. But if it's gravity, okay. He can maybe he can float, maybe he can throw people around. It obeys his his whims. Very interesting, I think. That's a good one. And there are a lot of different ways that you can use it. Let's look at whims here. Whims refers to sudden desires or changes of mind that appear to be thoughtless or without any particular reason. Example, my little sister is full of whims. One moment she wants to go to the park, the next she insists on staying home and playing with her toys. It's difficult to plan anything with John because he often changes plans according to his whims. And it's interesting that we get specifically whims examples because if we had asked for whim, I think we would have got maybe less relevant examples, uh, less relevant at least for this particular for this particular clip, right? All right, let's keep going. Oh, you know what I forgot to do on this one? Let me just do it because I like to do it. My whims, my whims. I like it to show up. All right, next one. You must find Counter Earth familiar. Counter Earth? I visited your planet many years ago. Earth hasn't been my planet in a long time. Your people had wonderful spirit. Mm. Your people had wonderful spirit. Had wonderful spirit. Mm. Had wonderful spirit. Mm. The art. Wonderful spirit. I thought a spirit was something that like a ghost or the, the essence of, of who you are. Maybe the thing that exists after you die, right? Someone's essence, that's their spirit. Well, spirit is used in a lot of ways. You have the spirit of the times. That's the, the general essence of this unique period of time, right? We can also use spirit to mean more like attitude, more like energy, life. If you say someone has spirit, not a spirit, but they have spirit, that means they are lively. That means there's a certain look in their eyes. There's something unique or special about them. Maybe they don't just go with the flow, right? This is often to point out something unique about someone, usually in a positive sense, right? So he's saying that of all the planets that he's visited, Earth is unique because humans have spirit, which I think is a very interesting way to describe it. But I'm curious if ChatGPT can give us spirit in this sense because there are so many different ways that spirit can be used. So I'm actually a little skeptical of what we're going to get for this, but let's see what we get. Multiple meanings. It can refer to a person's character, courage. Uh-huh, that's more like it. Or determination. It can also be a non-physical part of a person, often considered immor immortal. Additionally, it can refer to the intended meaning or feeling of something, such as uh, a law or statement. Right. So let's see what we get from these examples here. Her spirit is truly inspiring. She never gives up, no matter how tough the situation gets. Intended meaning, we didn't follow the letter of the law. All right, so let's now do this. Give me two more examples uh, with the first meaning. Let's see what we get here. Two more examples with the first meaning. Okay, spirit to denote character, courage, determination, which is what we want. Despite the challenges, he showed a competitive spirit and strive to win the race. Even in the face of adversity, she maintains a cheerful spirit that uplifts everyone around her. Yeah, that's that sort of courage, um, something unique, uh, someone's character, 
it could be determination, but it's it's even more than that, I think. Uh, it can be used very broadly, but there's something unique that stands out about someone with spirit. Interesting word. All right, great. Let's keep going. Wonderful spirit. Mm. The art and music and literature were some of the finest in the universe. Earth would be a fabulous place were it not for the ignorance and bigotry. Okay. It inspired me to create counter -earth. I don't care. All of the good and none of the bad. I don't need another speech by some impotent whack job who's mo Okay, listen to whack job. This is going to be our next one, so listen carefully to whack job. Now, the spelling of this is kind of up in the air. It seems like some people are spelling this W-H-A-C-K job. Some W-A-C-K job. Uh, the best I could come up with was W-A-C-K job. But uh, the spelling of this seems to be unclear. Some official dictionaries have it as W-A-C-K. Some have it as W-H-A-C-K. Very interesting. Um, and some even have it as one word, whack job. A whack job is in one word whack job instead of two. Need another speech by some impotent whack job. The bad. I don't need another speech by some impotent whack job whose mother didn't love him rationalizing none of the bad. I don't need another speech by some impotent whack job whose mother. Okay, what is a whack job then? You can probably get it from the context. He's impatient. He's clearly argumentative. He clearly doesn't like this guy. This guy is the villain of the story. So if he's an impotent whack job, he may be a psycho, he may be crazy, he may be, uh, he may be delusional. There are a lot of different, uh, someone who acts in a crazy way, someone who acts abnormally, uh, destructively, there are a lot of different personality types or behaviors that we could refer to uh, when we say whack job. It's pretty broad in that sense, but it, it's not a good thing and it's usually referring to something yeah, out, of the, out of the norm that we could call, let's say, crazy. Well, let's see. Whack job. Definition. Whack job is a slang term often used to refer to someone who is considered crazy, eccentric, or highly unusual. That conspiracy theorist we met at the park seemed like a real whack job, making wild claims with no evidence. Everyone thought the inventor was a whack job when he first proposed the idea, but he ended up revolutionizing the industry. Wow. So he wasn't a whack job after all. Okay. So it's an opinion, right? You can, you can use it. If you think someone is crazy, you can say, well, you're a whack job. It's not that bad, right? It's like saying you're crazy. You might make, make a comment if someone says something unusual. Okay. Now... One more to do. Impotent whack job whose mother didn't love him, rationalizing why he needs to conquer the universe. Some impotent whack job. Rationalizing. Rationalizing why he needs to conquer the universe. Rationalizing why he needs to conquer the universe. Job whose mother didn't love him, rationalizing why he needs to conquer the universe. Rationalizing why he needs to conquer the universe. Whack job whose mother didn't love him, rationalizing why he needs to conquer the universe. I'm not trying to conquer the universe. I'm perfecting it. Okay. So, if you rationalize something, the end is already decided. You've already said, yeah, I'm going to do this. Yeah, I've decided this. Yeah, this is my plan. Yeah, this is who I am. And so the end result is done. Whether that's who we are, our, our identity, right? An action we take, right? A decision we make, a major life choice, uh, a political opinion, all of these things we may rationalize. So how do we fit things that explain this to this, right? That process is the process of rationalize, rationalizing that thing, that political opinion, that life choice, okay? So, is that a positive thing or a negative thing? Well, it's often used as a negative thing because what it often suggests is we're trying to explain so why we did something or why we think something to try to justify it to ourselves and make ourselves feel good. 
yeah, I did the right thing. Yeah, this is right. It's right. I'm right. I'm right. I'm right. Now let me explain why to myself. So is that positive? That suggests that you won't change your mind. That suggests that you can't admit you might be wrong. That suggests that that maybe, you know, moving to another country wasn't the best move. And you're just trying to find an an explanation about why that happened and believe in that explanation. So it's often sort of used to talk about self-delusion when we talk about rationalizing things. You you could use it in a, in a positive sense, but it, generally it is used to talk about almost lying to yourself. You know, ras rationalizing is similar in that sense to justifying, although justifying is more often used for both negative and positive. So rationalize. Rationalizing refers to the act of justifying or explaining one's behavior, decisions, or beliefs in a logical or rational manner, even when these justifications might be based on false premises or self-deception. Thank you, ChatGPT, for agreeing with me 100%. He was all, always rationalizing his procrastination, meaning you always delay and say, I'll do it later, I'll do it later, saying that he worked better under pressure, but in reality, he was just avoiding the tasks. She's been rationalizing her excessive shopping sprees as retail therapy, but it's clear she's just avoiding dealing with, with her financial problems. Yes. So, this guy is rationalizing conquering the world, actually fixing the world, right? And uh, Quill thinks that he's delusional. And uh, he, he probably is. I mean, look at him. He looks crazy. Right? He's just crazy purple clothes and his face is stretched back and he's talking about how he can control gravity. He's a really good villain. In this movie, he does a really good job. This actor is very good at portraying a pretty, uh, pretty crazy, uh, pretty crazy person. A real whack job, we could say. So, can you make your own sentences? Can you use what you've learned in your daily life? Right? If you're actually taking what you're learning from a scene, you see it in context, and you can actually use it, it's gonna stick. It's more likely to stick. So see if you can make a couple of examples. Feel free to share those in the comments. If you haven't done so, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe. You can also ask any questions in the comments, and you can get a free course, Natural English Conversations. That is in the links in the description. All right. Okay, we survived. All right. A few more things I want to get to. Again, if there are any interesting questions, I'll do my best to answer those here live. Uh, keep those coming. We're going to talk a little bit about British versus American English, and I'm going to go through pronunciation in ChatGPT, which should be pretty interesting. Let me pop up one thing here. All right, let's head over to our Blackboard. And all right, here we go. American English and British English are similar in a lot of ways, different in a lot of ways. We're going to explore some words, spelling, idioms and pronunciation differences that help to show us what's unique about American English, right? What is kind of special about American English? I like American English. I like the pronunciation. Honestly, I like the pronunciation of American English. I suppose I'm biased <laughs> because it's the one I grew up in, 
but I do like it. And I think the spelling makes a lot of sense too. But what are those things? I want to explore them together. So let's start with words. So in both American and British English, we often use the same words, but refer to different things with those words. So for example, apartment and flat. So Americans use the word flat as an adjective and British people use the word apartment uh, to refer to a certain type of flat. I believe that's how it works. But generally speaking, if you're talking about where you live and you live in a building, Americans will say apartment and British people will say flat, my flat, my apartment. But essentially that is the same thing, right? For cookie and biscuit, it's a little more interesting because cookie is anything that is sweet and is sort of shaped like a circle or a square, right? And is made out of flour generally, right? And it's fairly broad. But British people also use cookie and, and biscuit and a specific type of biscuit is a cookie. I think that's how it works. I could be wrong about that. But Americans use biscuit too. But when we say biscuit, what we're talking about is this big fluffy thing that's not sweet at all. It's savory that we might put gravy on top of. Biscuits and gravy. It's very fluff, fluffy. It's like bread. It's a kind of, it's a kind of bread. It's un totally unlike a cookie. So that's an interesting difference, right? Flashlight and torch are the same thing. So British people say torch and Americans say flashlight. But what I'm not sure about is what British people say when they have the thing on the stick with the fire. I guess that's not a common situation, so maybe you don't need to say it often, but maybe they're both torch. So Americans say torch for the thing on the stick with the fire, and they say flashlight for the thing with the batteries that shines the light. And in England, I believe both of those would be torch. For a car, the front of the car that you lift up to look at the engine is the hood in America and bonnet in the UK, and I think in Canada, I could be wrong about that, but I think I think in Canada they might say, do they say hood or bonnet? I'm not sure. Someone check me on that. My, my Canadian English is out of date. I'm not sure. But Americans do say bonnet. So a bonnet would be something that a, an, an Amish woman would wear, right? With a thing that goes out of the front like this. A specific style of headwear, headgear, <laughs> worn by certain people. That would be a bonnet, right? And British people would say hood maybe means the thing that is on your hoodie, the hood on your hoodie, right? Goes up over your head. That is still the hood and not the bonnet, right? So again, used by both, but we have to be careful about the, the meanings. And I'm not sure about all of the meanings, but in, in England, I mean, but for American English, I find it's, I don't know, I, I feel like it's very straightforward. Because for example, the next one, we have vacation and holiday. So when the British, when a, when a person from the UK says, I'm going on holiday, that to me says that they are going somewhere, leaving somewhere. But in America, we would say specifically, I'm on holiday, but that just means I'm not like summer holiday, winter holiday, like winter break. It's, it's the period of time, right? Or a holiday being an important day in the year, like Christmas, right? That would be a holiday, whereas a vacation is when we actually go somewhere. So vacation in America is going somewhere and holiday is a particular day in the year or a period of time where we're just not working. For example, when you're at school and you don't have to go to school in the summer, that might be summer holiday or summer break. Now it's common to say summer break as well. And then pants and trousers, that's the classic one. In the UK, pants refers to, I believe, underwear, your pants. In America, pants are all trousers. And Americans don't often use trousers. Uh, an American might think when they hear trousers of formal pants, like, like khakis or slacks or something like that, they, we know trousers, we just don't use them very often. And when we want to talk about that sort of thing, we use pants. So when we go to the UK and we hear pants, we're thinking of long things that you wear, but actually what maybe what they're talking about is underwear, what we would call underwear. So anyway, a lot of interesting nuances there and you have to kind of 
I don't know, you have to enjoy the differences to to sort of learn them and watch a lot of I would say I would argue watch a lot of a lot of TV shows. What about spelling? So this is an interesting one and I feel like American English is 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 better in this respect. It really is. Because British English is it's kind of what happens with spelling in languages, especially in English as it evolves over time is it, it things get simplified uh, in pronunciation but often the spelling lags behind. That's why we still spell night, K-N-I-G-H-T, and enough E-N-O-U-G-H instead of E-N-U-F or something like that. E-N-U-F-F would be enough, would be the best way to spell that phonetically, but we don't spell it like that because spelling sticks. It's in books. It's harder to change. It changes more slowly over time. But American English uses different spellings from British English spelling. I think they're more straightforward, personally. And there are a lot of them, but a few examples. Uh, anytime you see O-R, often at the end of a word in American English, it'll be O-U-R in British English. That doesn't mean we never use O-U-R in American English, but for a lot of the word endings specifically, and especially R-E and E-R, I believe that's the influence of French on English. The R-E is the French spelling, and then Americans reverse the E-R in American English. Realize and realize I-S-E and I-Z-E for a lot of those words that end with or have that S at the end. Now, this one makes perfect sense to me because it is a Z sound, right? Like size, there's a Z there. Realize, there's a Z there. And when I see that R-E-A-L-I-S-E, my brain goes realize. And I think, what? It's confusing, right? It's the same with, uh, it's the, same with the word like uh, advertisement. Uh, although, I suppose for advertisement, now my brain doesn't do that for ad advertisement because I've seen that spelled both ways in America. So in some areas, we're, we're not, in some areas, we're like this weird hybrid where sometimes we're using the British spelling and sometimes we have our own American spelling. Sometimes it's both. It, it gets messy. It gets sort of complicated. Canceled the double L. Why do you need two L's? Yeah, you know, one L is enough. I think that's fine, right? And that's another common one you see sometimes double letters, particularly L uh, in British English and the American spelling being only one. Okay, also interesting. Now let's go on to, let's go on to some idioms. Now, we're not looking at comparisons here. These are idioms that are specifically from America, specifically unique American idioms. Spill the beans to tell a secret, to reveal something. Spill the beans. Tell me what happened. This is, well, it's obviously, it's a can of beans. We can picture a can of beans and the beans falling out of the can. Someone has spilled the beans. They've sort of revealed something. They've let everything out. To bite the bullet comes from, I believe, comes from the Civil War, where they would have to do amputations, but they didn't have any uh, anesthetic, and so you'd have to actually bite down on a bullet to bear the pain. <laughs> so bite the bullet means to just suffer through something, get through it. Just bite the bullet and do it, right, to get through something difficult. To throw in the towel comes from boxing, right? To throw in the towel means you quit, right? I'm going to throw in the towel. I'm done. I can't do it anymore. I can't handle it for any sort of situation, a project you're working on, uh, whatever it is, right? A marriage, any, anything like that, you might throw in the towel, meaning you give up. And again, that comes from boxing. Jump on the bandwagon. So to jump on a bandwagon is to join a popular movement. To jump on a bandwagon is to... Um, see that everyone else is doing that, so you start doing that, right? To jump off the bandwagon is to, or to fall off the bandwagon is sometimes used to, well, if it's just wagon, it's used to talk about addiction and things you're addicted to, but uh, it can be used to mean sort of jump off the bandwagon, the opposite of, I, I don't like this movement anymore. It's much more common to say jump on the bandwagon to join something that's popular, right? And it can be used in other ways, in other ways too. Couch potato is a person sitting on the sofa uh, eating chips and, or crisps rather, and they're lazy. So a couch potato is a lazy person or someone who's just behaving in a lazy way right now. I just want to relax for the weekend. I want to be a couch potato. That doesn't mean I'm a lazy person. Maybe I'm rewarding myself working very hard. Now I get to be lazy. So Leave me alone. Let me watch TV. I just want to relax and decompress over the weekend. And then I'll go back to being a very productive human being, right? So, common. 
we have one more category to talk about, and that category is pronunciation. Now, the interesting thing about pronunciation differences between American English and British English is, yeah, is, that's right, I got lost in my own sentence, that uh, most of the time it's the same. <laughs> For a lot of stuff, people get the idea that there's this British accent is just totally different, every sound is different, no, a lot of the sounds are the same. But because certain sounds are in many words, then it sounds like a lot. It's not as much as you as you might as you might imagine. But for example, the R sound. But not all the R sounds. For example, the word hard that has one R and that R is at the end of the word. And so those end of word or word ending or syllable ending R sounds, if it's at the end of the syllable or the end of the word, is going to be more open for British English and more hard for American English, meaning we really stick our tongues up and backward to say that clear er sound. Har, har, hard, right? That's the sound. And that doesn't mean that British people can't make the R sound because for a word like rare, rare, they say the er part exactly the same. But they don't say rare because Americans say rare. The second R sound at the end of the word or the end of the syllable is instead more open, like rare. And so it's it's not, they don't curl it up for the end often, right? So my British, which I have a terrible British accent, but my British version of hard would be hard and rare, 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 and hard, hard. So that, ah, uh, there's a thing there, right? But it's not the clear R sound. And I know that's not a perfectly realistic British accent, but that, that's the basic idea, right? What about... B-E-T-T-E-R and W-A-T-E-R. So uh, this is interesting because there are a lot of different dialects, of course, in, in British English as well. But if you have the T there in this sort of situation where there's an R, an E-R after it, or often a lot of vowels after it, then Americans will, will say this very interesting thing called a light D sound. We will say better and water, better and water, better and water. And, and you do hear British people saying that sometimes too. But I, I feel like it's more common, or much more common at least than in America, for British people to say better and water, more, right? And you also hear a complete stop sound where it's better and water, and that, that happens too. So either completely skips the T sound or hits the T sound as a T sound, and Americans tend to say better and water. There's a da 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 da. There's a light D sound, and it, that's an oversimplification, of course. But um, generally speaking, Americans are more likely to hit that T as a D when there's that vowel sound following the T. In the case of better and water. Now, what about button and mountain? So. For button and mountain, I think both British people and American people, for both pronunciations, button and mountain would be common. We would both say both. But sometimes there's a difference. So, for example, Americans may often skip the T, uh, the T sound, for example, in mountain after the N, and skip the T sound in the middle by saying button and mountain. Button and mountain. So there, there's a stop in the voice. That's the stop T. The voice goes huh, like that, cuts off, and then it continues. Button, mountain. And that's a unique sound, right? And that might be something that, that British people will do sometimes too, or the British accent has that sometimes as well. For example, wa 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 is that right? That's like a Cockney. Wa, wa, wa. There's this uh, that uh, wa 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 that that stop sound there. My I'm 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 outing myself as a, having a terrible British accent, but that sound there, that stop sound, it is there in British English. But you're more likely to hear button, a clear button, and a clear mountain than what Americans do in those specific cases, which is more often button mountain now there's also some interesting differences in let's just say some different words right for example americans say advertisement 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 
In American English, no matter how you spell it, <laughs> right? In American English, if you say that, advertisement, the first syllable is stressed. Advertisement. And it's a ties sound. You might hear in British English more often a stress on the second syllable. So adver, adver. And then instead of a tiesment, maybe advertisement, 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 tisment. So there's an S sound instead of a Z sound. But I think the important difference there is on the stress of the syllable, stressing the second syllable rather than the first syllable. Now, there's another interesting difference, which I, I, I find quite interesting because uh, not all H has, not all H words have this, but in the case of a word like H-E-R-B, Americans say herb. We cut out the H sound. And we say our, our and herb. For example, H-O-U-R and, and H-E-R-B. We use the same rule for both of those. Those both don't have a pronounced H at the beginning. It's herb and our. Whereas in uh, British English, you get our, but it's herb. So you hear the H there. Inconsistent? A little bit? Maybe? I don't know. I mean, I mean I'm not making... I mean, yeah, it is. It is a little inconsistent. So... I prefer herb, but again, I'm very biased. I'm heavily biased. I mean, this whole thing is extremely biased, of course. I'm totally biased, 100%. Tomato, Americans will say tomato. There's an A sound there. And British, the British accent might be more likely to be tomato. Tama, tama. More of an ah sound there. Diff slightly different vowel sound. And again, that's oversimplified because there are a lot of dialectical differences in the UK, right? In the United States of America, tons, right? So these are generalities, but I think interesting generalities. So if you have any questions or other interesting examples you'd like to share about American English, British English, or whatever, feel free to let me know in the comments. If you haven't already done so, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe. And also check out my free course, Natural English Conversations, in the links in the description. Cool. There is one other thing I want to talk about, so we'll get to that. We'll get to that, we'll get to that, we'll get to that. I just got an email saying that I'm live. Yeah, I know I'm live. I'm live. I, I'm the first to know. I'm, I'm the one who is. Of course. Okay, and I'm surprisingly doing okay in terms of my sort of mental focus. I'm here, I'm still here. After five days of no eating, I'm still here. My mind is still, still awake. Hooray. All right, let's get to, let's get to... pronunciation. Hey. Mm hmm. Mm. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay. Can you use ChatGPT to improve your pronunciation? Well, ChatGPT can't hear, right? Unless you use a plugin like this, where you speak a little bit and it dictates whatever you say. And hey, why isn't it dictating what I say? What's up with my speech thing? Hey, come on. Dictate what I say, you dingus. Okay. These plugins are very unreliable. Anyway, that's not the point. So, how can we learn and improve pronunciation with ChatGPT? I'm not going to be sharing a way for you to have ChatGPT listen to you and analyze. There are other tools and platforms for that, and I think there will continue to be more in the future. What I'm talking about is how can you build 
exercises that can help you improve your pronunciation. We're going to look at three specific things very quickly here. The first one, we're going to ask for a very specific example that we can use to practice specific sounds. So, maybe you know what your issues are. You know that you struggle with the TH sound. You know that you struggle with intonation. You know that you struggle with uh, linking words together in sentences. Maybe you've listened to yourself and you're able to identify things, or maybe you have a You've had a teacher and they've pointed some things out to you. It's a good exercise to do, right? To take a few lessons with a teacher and ask them, hey, what are my pronunciation issues? What do I need to focus on next? Okay. So then you can go into ChatGPT and ask for a bespoke exercise to help you practice those difficult sounds. So here's what we do. We ask for a short paragraph to help me work on my weak areas of English pronunciation. Okay, this is what I want. But then I state that I struggle with specific sounds. I struggle with the following sounds. Okay, and I'm, I give examples. I think this is important to give examples because, for example, S, well, S can be pronounced in different ways, and maybe I don't struggle with all of those different ways. I struggle with S as in vision and usually, that zh, that strange S. The S sound in words like vision and usually. The voiced TH sound in words like this and father. So I, maybe I don't struggle with think or thank you, right? Or, or, or fatch, but I struggle with this and father, that voiced one, okay? And V and W sounds, I always get these mixed up. So I'm getting confused with V and W, okay? So I ask for this exercise. And what I get should help me, should be an example that can help me to, um, should be an example that can help me to essentially practice again and again to build the habits that I need. And this is not giving me what I want. So make a short paragraph. I'm gonna, or maybe it is, but it's giving me a long explanation first. All right, are you done? That's not what I want. Try again, please. There we go. Second try is the charm, as they say. Sometimes there's this thing that ChatGPT GPT does called hallucinating, and it's just it's part of it's part of it. You know, sometimes you just get some wacky thing that's it's not obeying my instructions. I said specifically, give me a short paragraph to help me work on my weak areas, right? Now, if you want to, you can give it examples to say, like this one, and then it'll be more likely to be consistent. But yeah, generally speaking, here we go. Venturing through the vivacious valley, Weasley the Weaver, is that Wesley? Wesley the Weaver and his father, Theodore, envisioned a wondrous world where vast waves of velvety grass whispered soothingly. Usually they wandered wrestling with the weight of their woven wares, while voicing their appreciation for the warmth and beauty uh, that enveloped them. Okay, so this is quite good, right? And what we get here is a lot of practice with V and W. We get uh, we get some practice with the father, right? We we get this envisioned. We get some specific sounds with that strange S that we struggle with. And so usually is here. We've got usually here, right? So. We might try a few versions of this. We might ask for another one and another one as a way to repeat and repeat and repeat. Often the thing with pronunciation is you want, even if you know how to make the sound correctly, you forget when you're talking because it's not a habit. So once you build up that habit, then you don't have to think about it. So that's what this specific exercise is for. Okay, but that's not all. Now, what if... I want to be able to see the pronunciation. Well, again, ChatGPT is not quite there yet in terms of seeing, or helping you visualize or say things that you can listen to, right? You can look up a word and listen to the sound in any, basically any dictionary. But what if I want to see phonetic spelling? Now, I know some of you prefer the phonetic spelling with symbols. I don't. So I like to use phonetic respelling. 
right? Pronunciation, respelling. Personally, do it with do it with whatever one you prefer, right? Sometimes it's useful to see it written out so that you can think of it in a different way. Maybe I'm struggling to pronounce things and I need a reminder to sort of break my brain of uh, this word is pronounced that way, not the way that it actually looks, right? Provide the pronunciation respelling, very important, including syllable word stress. So that means big words for a stressed syllable. I want to see big words for a stressed syllable of the following sentence. In the vivid vision of a leisurely afternoon, a father, usually quiet, discussed. Okay, so just, just a sentence. We're not worrying about the specific sentence, but here we go. Oh, no. Oh, oh no, it's giving me the symbol. I don't want the symbols. Get out of here with the symbols. Use pronunciation respelling. No. Oh, yes. Oh, good. Uh, nope, it's still got this. Do not. Do not use any symbols. All right. Got it. I've got to get. Bring ChatGPT to task. Okay, it's giving me the full list here. This is better, but I want to see it in a paragraph. In, in, oh, this is good because it's word by word. Actually, this is pretty good. This is what I was looking for, minus the minus the stress. Okay, all right, we have to iterate through this here. Okay. Write it as a paragraph and include the stress, the syllable stress in all caps okay that's what i want to see i want to see all caps for the syllable stress come on let's see what you've got hey now we're getting there okay it took a couple in the vivid vision of a leisurely afternoon so I can see the stress of the of the word, which syllable is stressed, and that looks that looks usually that looks pretty good. And I'm able to sort of look at these in a different way. And that's the use of sometimes phonetic spelling. Again, if you like the symbols, knock yourself out. That's totally fine with me. I don't care. But you want you want to get to something that's useful that can help you remember pronunciation when you're practicing. So if I see children, I remember, okay, chill is the stressed syllable, not dren. So maybe you take this a step further and you don't want the full phonetic spelling. You just want the stressed syllable in all caps. I know how to pronounce the words, but I often forget which syllable in the word is stressed. And I want to remember that. So here you would say, uh, rewrite this paragraph with common spelling, but keep the stressed syllable in all caps, okay? So what we wanna see then is just a regular paragraph and we wanna see, we wanna see exactly this. We wanna see which part of the word has the stress on it. And this again, looks correct in the vivid vision of a leisurely afternoon, a father usually quiet, discussed with his children, the whimsical. Yeah, so this looks pretty good. It actually hasn't used completely natural spelling because it's got two U's here. But, you know, we get, we can see the word a little more easily. So maybe you want to do it that way. Find the right balance for you, right? And once you've found the right balance, you've kind of trained a little model for yourself. That's your pronunciation tab, right? So then just bring in another sentence and practice that one and bring in another sentence and practice that one. Once you teach, once you hone it, once you get to what you want with ChatGPT, and now I have what I want, then it's fairly, usually fairly repeatable. And I think that's the, that's the power of, uh, that's the power of the iterative way of working. Now we have one more to look at here. We're going to 
explore specific words. I want to know any rules. There are rules with words, and I want to understand. I want to understand the theory behind pronunciation a little bit. So, okay, let's. Let, if that's what you want, if that's what you want, I'm not saying that's the best thing, but you might want to know that stuff. So it's useful. Explain. Explain. So I'm looking for a teacher here. This is a teacher's role. Explain the word stress of the words I provide and give any rules associated with them. Only use pronunciation respelling, okay? Here are the words. Here we go. Sure, I can provide. I can certainly, I don't know what's wrong with me. Sure, I can certainly provide you with the word stress information for the words you listed, okay? Usually, usually, very good. This word has three syllables. Huh? It's just listed four syllables. Well, usually can have three syllables, though, so maybe that's what it's going with. Usually is an interesting word because it can have either three or four syllables. The primary stress is on the first syllable, you. Uh, remaining syllables, ju, ali. Oh, it's considering ali. Yeah. Mm, okay, fair enough. Not, not perfect. Rule, in many English words, the first syllable tends to be stressed, especially in words that have prefixes. However, English word stress patterns uh, can often be unpredictable and learned through exposure and practice. And I would agree with that. The best way to learn what stress to have on a word is to just kind of absorb it by using it. So that's true. Exposure and practice. Pizza. That is correct. This word has two syllables. The primary stress is on the first syllable, P. The second syllable, t, is unstressed. Absolutely. Rule, like the first example, this also follows a common trend where the first syllable is stressed. However, it's important to note that many borrowed words in English like pizza from Italian retain their original stress pattern. And then try, labite, again, three syllables. Okay, so you get the idea. Remember, English does not have strict rules for word stress. There are That's true. They're not strict. It's so complicated and nuanced. And there are many exceptions. Absolutely also true. These rules are general trends and may not apply to every word. It's often necessary to learn the correct pronunciation for each word individually. So it's very cool to get the breakdown, I think, and useful as a way to explore it. But you have to always remember, hey, this is pronunciation we're talking about, and it's very flexible, and it's hard to apply hard and fast rules every single time. You will always find exceptions. So we've looked at really three approaches, right? We've looked at a way to build an exercise based on problem words. We've looked at a way to visualize pronunciation a little more easily by turning text into phonetic symbols, if that's your thing, it's not my thing, or for example, pronunciation respelling, where we can see it in a different way to practice pronouncing it, or just stressing or focusing on specific stress, seeing the stress in all caps. And we looked at a way to break words down into their component parts and rules. And that's an interesting way to maybe remember something or find a pattern that you didn't see before, right? It can be very useful to do that too. So if you have any questions about this, let me know. Give this a try. Let me know how it goes in the comments. If you haven't already done so, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe. And also check out my free course, Natural English Conversations, in the links in the description. Okay. All right. About that time, eh? About that time. Well, well, thank you all so much for joining. That is all for us today. Those are our four main things that I wanted to cover. I hope you learned something. I hope you got something out of it. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go eat something. I think I'm gonna eat a little bit. I'm gonna take a little. I'm gonna take a munch of something very small to uh, to break my fast because it's about that time. I've been fasting again. I've been fasting for five days. It's been quite an experience, quite a journey, but it's. It's time to break it, uh, and I'm going to do it very slowly in a safe way and drink lots of water, of course, as well. So thank you for joining. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Again, join the Discord if you'd like to do that. That is a free community that you can join. I share updates there. Regular content goes up there as well. When I launch a course, usually I notify everybody to get a special discount on the course. So that's there. No, if you did a uh, Olga says dry fasting. No, if you did a five day dry fast, you would die. <laughs> you can do, you can do a daily dry fast. That's, I mean, that's, 
Ramadan, right? Uh, it's a dry fast from sunrise to sunset, but you're eating every day, you're drinking every day. Uh, this is a water fast that I'm doing. So you can do a water fast up to, I think the record is several hundred days, I believe, but usually people do five days, seven days, some people do 10, and a, a let's say long water fast would be 30 to 40 days. And I'm not there yet. I might do a 30 to 40 day water fast someday, but it's an interesting experience. Anyway, thank you all for joining. If you haven't already, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe. Check out the courses. Links in the description. You can get a monthly membership as well. There should be a 30% off link in there for in the links for the monthly membership. And Olga says I do a 36 day, 36 dry fasting on oh every two weeks. Oh, 36 hour dry fast. Okay, that that's still that's still long to not drink any water. That's pretty insane. That's insane. That's crazy. I mean, cool, but good on you, but I can't imagine not having water for 36 uh, 36 hours. Amazing. You wouldn't want to go far beyond that, I would imagine. That would be could be dangerous. 36 hours. Yeah. 36 days. <laughs> yeah. I think the limit on not drinking water is three or something like three days. So you're getting close to halfway there. So be careful, <laughs> be safe. All right. Anyway, thanks again. Have a great weekend. Like and subscribe courses in the links. Check out the audio version if you like too. And what else? Is there anything else? Is there anything else? Is there anything else? I don't think so. I don't think there's anything else. Okay. So have a great weekend and I will see you in the next one.